Internet here is really, really unstable. Um, we are not really not sure if they could complete it and if you could not, I'll be really disappointed. Yeah. Uh, uh, good evening, all of you. Uh, this is this is just a new technique. We the technique itself is not new, but this is the first time I have used it in one of the AV intervention cases. So I thought it is uh, uh, worthwhile sharing. Yes, Are you, seeing, are you seeing it, sir? No, we were seeing. Yeah, yes, now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, to start with, like, uh, our patient is a 60 year old in state renal disease patient on hemodialysis with a left tubercular cephalic fistula. Was referred to us primarily with a headache on the left side, worsening during dialysis. Other than that, the venous pressure was slightly high. Um, it was overall otherwise okay. No other issues during or after dialysis, like prolonged bleeding time or etc. An examination, there were telltale signs of outflow obstruction, like a angry looking hyperpacitate fistula, which did not collapse on hand elevation. And uh, otherwise, no evidence of central vein obstruction, like distended vein, sauma, face swelling, etc. This plan for a venogram and proceed. And uh, this is the venogram. I'm sorry if I'm a little fast. Uh, I'm really anxious if it could really complete it. So this is the venogram. You can see the prominent uh, vasculature due to the uh, uh, high outflow for a long period of time. You can see the cephalic vein with uh, a doubtful lesion in the cephalic arch. So it's a cephalic vein, and you can see a maybe doubtful, I could say like it's around the 30, 40% stenosis in the cephalic arch. And he's got a brachycephalic vein, and I could say it's around 70% stenosed. And you are seeing a prominent reflux of blood into the internal jugular vein. Uh, as his uh, uh, bleeding time was normal and there was no evidence to, uh, no other clinical features to uh, uh, to make the cephalic arch stenosis significant, we thought probably the reflux of uh, blood into the internal jugular, that was the reason for his headache. And consequently, we decided to manage the central lesion alone to start with. Also, the cephalic vein stenosis was roughly around 40%, I would say, which did not meet the angiographic criteria also for, uh, for uh, intervention. So we do most of the central vein interventions to the femoral root and, and uh, we did the same. We used uh, 8 mm followed by 12 and 14 mm atlas balloons to open up the lesions. All the balloons effaced completely without any waste. And this is the post-procedure angiogram. You can see the lesion has opened up uh, nicely. I would not say 100%, but I could say the residual stenosis was somewhere around, maybe around 40%, maybe. And the reflux into the jugular slightly reduced. It was not completely absent, but we decided to stop that. As we have used a 14 mm balloon, we did not want to go beyond that. So we stopped it. So there is the pre and post procedure images. You can see the brachycephalic stenosis here, which has reasonably opened up after the, uh, after the 14 mm balloon angioplasty. Just to show the size of the vessels, you can see the subclavian is almost 25 millimeters in diameter. So was the brace, left brachiocephalic vein, which was almost 24 millimeters in diameter. And this is the lesion after angioplasty, which is almost 12 millimeter, uh, which is 50% of the adjacent vein, which means the residual stenosis was close to 50%. Yeah, the patient went home and, uh, and his headache was apparently a little better. And uh, he came back four months later with a prolonged bleeding time this time and with the high venous pressures during dialysis. On examination, the findings are similar, but for a even more angry looking hyperpulsatile hyper fistula. And we did an angiogram again and, uh, and decided to proceed further. Here, the findings are, I would say, pretty much the same. You can see the cephalic vein with uh, cephalic arch stenosis, along with uh, a re uh, stenosis of the brachiocephalic vein on the left side. As you could see here, the cephalic vein and the cephalic arch, it's, it appears as if the lesion is slightly worse than the uh, last time. I could put it at 50 to 60% stenosis maybe. And the brachiocephalic vein on the left side is almost like the last time, it's almost 70 to 80% stenosis, it looked like. And there was a good amount of reflux into the internal jugular vein this time as well. As this time, the patient had a prolonged bleeding time as well. We wanted to address both the lesions. And... Uh, we started with the 12 and 14 mm balloon for the brachycephalic and we used the 8 and 9 mm balloon for the cephalic cast. Again, both the balloons effaced completely without any waste. Uh, but this is the post procedure angiogram. You can see it was appearing slightly better. As you can see here, the cephalic, uh, the brachycephalic was appearing slightly better than the pre-op, uh, the, the pre uh, pre-procedure picture. 
and the cephalic coach is also looking a little better. I could not say it is completely normal because the fistula was still hyperpulsatile. Uh, deep down, I knew like uh, we did not do much for the patient. It was it was almost the same, and uh, no of none of his clinical feature problems are now going to improve. So at this time, we needed to decide what to do next. So as I told you, the AV fistula remained the same with uh, hyperpulsatility and uh, and uh, systolic thrill only, and it was not collapsing on hand elevation which means the venous pressure was still high and there was a prominent obstruction. And this time, as we, as I told you, both the lesions are completely open with the balloon. There was no waste in the balloons, meaning both the lesions are elastic because if the, if the lesion has opened up completely, there should not be any re-stenosis. But as you could see, the lesion was not uh, completely opened up despite the balloon effacing completely, which means the lesions are elastic. As per recommendations, the elastic lesions needed uh, stenting and by convention, uh, if at all you want to put in a graft, uh, stent, uh, stent uh, uh, AV axis, it is better to put in a covered stent, that's a stent graft. For the cephalic cards, we normally prefer the Covira stent graft, which, which conforms nicely to the uh, curvatures of the vein. And for the brachiocephalic vein, we use a fluency plus stent graft, which that, if I'm not uh, wrong, that is the only available uh, covered stent at that size, 13 and a half or 14 millimeter in diameter. But if you see, both the stent grafts alone cost around uh, two to two and a half lakhs. And with other balloons and other things, like it could easily go around three to three and a half lakhs. The financial implication is really huge. So we need to take a call as to if you really want to stent it. And if yes, which one to stent? We want to stent the arch or the central vein or both. If you are really confused, that is when we, we sort of uh, thought of using this particular technique. We wanted to monitor the pressures across the lesions to decide what to do. This is nothing but an um, arterial pressure monitoring device. It is the same like we would have seen it in the ICU, wherein you uh, do a radial puncture and connect that to the pressure transducer and that gives the pressure in the monitor. This is a different patient though. You can see a sheath in the femoral vein and a 5 inch JR catheter inside the sheath. The outer end of the JR is uh, connected to the extension, which in turn is connected to the pressure transducer. So that is... Uh, so how it looked like, you can see the JR wire is connected outside to the extension. That in turn is connected to the pressure transducer, which in turn is connected to the monitor. So once you keep the catheter at the place where you want to uh, want to measure the pressure, the pressure will be shown up in the monitor like that. As you can see here, the pressure is somewhere around 18 bar 10 now. So that's how you do it. You keep the JR at the place where you want to measure the pressure and, and, and ask the patient to hold the breath in expiration so that uh, there will not be any respiratory variations in the pressure. And any difference of 10 millimeter or more is generally considered significant across the lesion, though the number is arbitrary. So these are the areas that we measured the pressure. As you can see, there are two uh, prominent lesions. The lesion is in the cephalic arch one and there is a lesion in the brachiocephalic vein. So we had to measure the pressure on either side of a lesion to see if a lesion is significant, which means we wanted to measure the pressure in number one, that is the cephalic vein before the cephalic arstenosis. And number two is the uh, part of the venous system, which is immediately distal to the cephalic arch, which is the subclavian vein. And number three is the left brachiocephalic vein, which is just in front of the brachiocephalic stenosis. And number four is the uh, lesion, I mean, the part of the vein is immediately distal, which is the upper part of the SVC. And number five is the uh, lower part of the SVC or, or, or the RA, right? Here. And these are the pressures. As you can see, is the systolic, diastolic, and the mean arterial pressure. As you can see, the, the pressure is, you can go by the mean arterial pressure. As you can see, the pressure is very high in the this part of the cephalic vein, that is the cephalic vein in front of the cephalic arch stenosis as compared to pressure in the subclavian where it is only 40. So the difference is huge. The pressure gradient is almost 80. As you can see, three and four, there is no gradient at all. It is 36 on the on three, and the mean pressure is 36 on four as well. That is, on either side of the central, suppose at central lesion, there is no gradient at all, meaning the lesion is apparently not significant at all. In retrospect, that is why the patient did not have any evidence of central venous stenosis like arm edema, facial edema, or prominent veins or collateral. So if, I, if, if we had done the pressure monitoring before, I would not have touched the central vein at all. Which me, now, after the monitoring, it is clear it is the cephalic arch which is significant due to the significant gradient we had seen. So now we wanted to address that and we wanted to put in a covered stent there. We wanted to put a 9 into 60 covira there. You can see uh, the stent placed across the arch and we deployed it through the fistula end so that the proximal end of the stent could be correctly placed at the cephalic arch and subclavian vein junction. And this is how it looked like after the deployment of the stent. 
So you can see the before and after images, see uh, the ugly looking cephalic arch stenosis. It is the cephalic arch after deployment of the stent. You can see the proximal end of the stent at the junction of the cephalic arch at the subclavian vein. This middle part of the stent is intentionally kept as a hover glass. We did not do much of a post stenting angioplasty to make sure it doesn't slip away into the central circulation. So immediately after stenting, you can see the pressure at number one from 126, it has fallen down to 68. And the gradient from 80 it has fallen down to 20. That means the stenting has worked. Immediately the fistula became soft and collapsible and the thrill became continuous and we know like uh, the stenting has done the job. And translational pressure ratio is the pressure ratio between the pressure on either side of the region. That is the pressure downstream. That is the pressure on at, uh, at uh, number two, the subclavian vein divided by the pressure at the cephalic vein. That is 41 divided by 126. That will be 0 0.3. That is the pressure gradient before doing the stenting. And after the stenting, it became 68. So 41 by 68 is 60. If the lesion is not significant, the ratio should approach towards one. In fact, one of the marker of a successful angioplasty is the translational pressure ratio more than 0.5 after angioplasty. So it is 0.6 in our case. And translational pressure gradient is the numerical difference in pressure. So that is 126 minus 41, 80 before the stenting and it has fallen down to 27 at the stenting. Normally any gradient of more than 10 is considered significant, but here uh, on one hand you have the cephalic vein, which is not a central vein. And on the other hand, you have the subclavian, which is a central vein. So I do not know how to compare the pressures between these two. Yeah, so as I told you, the AVF immediately became soft and collapsible and, uh, and the thrill became continuous. You were sent home, the dialysis became uneventful, the bleeding time normalized and the venous pressures are normal now. It's been almost two, now, two months and it's good, doing fine. Pressure monitoring inside, a few slides to finish it up. Pressure monitoring inside the axis is a valuable way to predict stenosis. It's been commonly used as a surveillance technique as well in addition to flow monitoring. There are two ways to monitor pressure, the dynamic and the static venous pressure. The dynamic venous pressure is the pressure in the axis during dialysis. That is what is shown in your dialysis machine. On the other hand, static venous pressure is the pressure in the axis once you put in the needle. You do not start dialysis. Once you put in the needle, you measure the pressure that gives you a static venous pressure. That is generally a better marker than dynamic venous pressure because in dynamic venous pressure, you have confounders in the form of blood flow, the needle size, and other things. In fact, the static venous pressure ratio, that is the ratio between the pressure in the axis divided by the mean arterial pressure is the better marker of uh, astenosis. Uh, generally, it is between 3 to 0.3 to 0.4. That is, the pressure in the axis is 30 to 40% of the mean arterial pressure. And it is more than 50%, it generally suggests an outflow stenosis. On the other hand, the ratio less than 0.3 generally points towards an inflow problem. I'm, I'm not sure how many of you guys are familiar with this functional uh, flow reserve in PCA. This is a technique they commonly do in coronary intervention, wherein they use a guide wire, a pressure transducer guide wire or a FFR wire, which, which costs almost 50,000 rupees. You pass it through the aorta, across the lesion and the coronary artery, take it distal to the lesion, and you measure the pressure in the lesion. That will be P distal. And you measure the pressure in the iota right at the origin of the coronary artery, that will be pressure in the iota. Normally, if the lesion is not significant, the pressure in the coronary should be as good as the iota, or the ratio should be close to 1. The ratio is more than 0.8, at least it is acceptable. If it is less than 0.8, it means the lesion is significant, and they go ahead and do an angioplasty and the stenting. And one marker of success is that after stenting, the ratio should approach 0.9, or it should be more than 0.8. The whatever we have done is almost similar to the FFR, but only difference being we used a diagnostic catheter here for, for fear of the cost. And uh, what we have, the, we have checked in an arterialized vein as compared to coronary artery. Yeah, few, few related articles. Uh, this translational pressure ratio, that is the ratio between uh, uh, the vascular segment on either side of the stenosis, that has been used as a marker to tell you about the success of an angioplasty. It has been, it has been compared with the typical or classical angiographic uh, feature of such a, that is, a, that is, which is less than residual stenosis, less than 30%. Uh, the translational pressure radio, radius, uh, sorry, the ratio more than 0.5 works very well as compared to the uh, uh, residual stenosis less than uh, 30%. In fact, if you use the ratio more than 0.5 along with the residual uh, stenosis less than 30%, it functions very well in the long term. If you can recollect the relation, the translational pressure ratio in our case is 0.6, which means we've done a reasonable job. 
again um, the the pressure gradient has been mentioned uh, been monitored in the central veins as as well as a marker of successful angioplasty any gradient more than 10 is considered significant and gradient less than 5 means a lesion has been taken care of properly again they have compared it with the classical angiographic success which is residual lesion less than 30% it has been shown that the post plastic gradient less than 5 mm mercury it performs very well as compared to an angiographic feature of success which is the residual lesion less than 30% again if you can see in our case the gradient fell from 86 to as low as 27 just to wind it up uh, uh, dr kumar sir is also here in this uh, forum uh, i was really uh, waiting to hear from him this is one of the one of the article uh, uh, published from from his team wherein they have looked for the uh, axis ratio the pressure ratio inside the axis that is the pressure in the axis as uh, compared to the mean arterial pressure Uh, any ratio more than I told you, the normal ratio is between 0.3 to 0.4. Any ratio more than 0.5 generally suggests could suggest an outflow stenosis. More than 0.5 for three instances, consecutive instances, will be a will be a recommendation to take the patient for an angioplasty. And they look for the ratio after angioplasty. And more the change in ratio after angioplasty, the higher is the long term success rate. So that also tells you one more one more usage of uh, vascular access pressure monitoring. to conclude pressure monitoring could be a valuable tool so you need not uh, have any fancy devices it's very very cost effective no much learning curve and there are few ways to document pressure like you can uh, check a translational pressure ratio or you can look for a translational pressure gradient or you can use a static pressure the intraaxis pressure bar mean arterial pressure ratio and so on and so forth as i told you you could use it as a regular tool during your interventions to know the effectiveness of the intervention and you can compare it with the residual stenosis less of less than 30% or you could use it in tough cases like in this case uh, if you could the angiographically the central lesion appeared significant but after the pressure monitoring there is no difference in grading at gradient at all which means the lesion was not significant you need not have touched the central lesion in first place so this could be a valuable tool uh, to our hava materium uh in in regular uh, vascular access angioplasty thank you i'm really thank sorry you. if you're fast yeah thank you thank you venki you are uh, i wanted to ask you you mentioned some papers you quoted some papers yes uh, sir what uh, method they use have they used a prefer uh, trans i mean uh, uh, sensor yes, or uh, your yes, uh, method of uh, doing trans i mean across the angiocatheters Yes, sir. in almost all of the articles where they have measured the pressure inside the axis, they always used the GR catheter method. They used a five French GR catheter. They kept in the part of the vascular system where we want to measure the pressure and uh, and measure it. The same like whatever we have done. Dr. Kumar sir can definitely enlighten on this. Now, uh, why isn't that uh, cardiologists are not using this? Of course, the caliber of the artery yes. is small. Yes. Yes. Exactly, sir. If you use a five French JR catheter in a coronary, it will completely block the coronary and it will dampen the pressure. It will give a false reading. But uh, there are micro catheters used to access the smaller vessels, no? So yes, sir. And it's it, as as good as the wire, sir. If you see the wire, it will be knowing. It is very very thin and it is exactly suited for that purpose. But it's a little costly, though. Yeah. Yes, Lal. I. Um, Venki, an excellent presentation. I'm I'm so glad that um, somebody is also thinking uh, the way I thought like few years ago. Um, Bala sir, thank you for giving an opportunity. You know, a couple of things I just wanted to highlight. Um, you did the right, absolutely the right thing by looking for translational uh, pressure gradient. Um, the central veins. <clears throat> I think when you uh, looked at it, you saw normalization or pseudo normalization uh, only just because the patient has a amazing uh, collateral circulation. Um, if the IJ was occluded on the left side, then the gradient would have existed. It's just that when you deal with the pressure across a lesion, uh, we should always keep in mind about the collaterals or any other. Um, uh veins which could dissipate the uh pressure right even in the fistula the same problem if you have a large aneurysm it dissipates the pressure so the your translational uh, gradient may not be high not because the stenosis is, is not critical it's just that the pressure behind the stenosis is being dissipated by other means right 
so but with that caveat like the way you use the cephalic arch perfect uh, place to use that uh, central veins if you didn't see that big of an ij uh, you probably would have seen nest um, gradient and you would have intervened um, so in my mind, I think you employed the translational um, pressure measurements in the very right setting or very appropriate settings. Um, it will be very expensive to use on a day-to-day -day basis. And the other thing, the, the caveat we should remember when we are using the translational is these recordings are momentary snapshots only, right? It's not a continuous one. And many of the lesions can uh, recoil after a couple of days or even 30 minutes after your end of your procedure. You Sometimes you see that the fistulas again become pulsatile because the elasticity not necessarily always recoils immediately, right? It can happen delayed recoil also. Um, and especially if there is an external compression on a, a structure like uh, your first rib is compressing upon and those things, they may not immediately show up, but they will show up later. And that's the reason why we, when I did the, the study, I used one week later after the intervention as to how much pressure drop actually happens, right? And, and its relationship to the next event. Um, what we do or what uh, all my studies involves is um, based upon a device called Vascolet. So the vasculate is a um, invention from our own hospital before I joined uh, the place. Now it is an FDA approved drug, uh, device which gets used in almost 100, 120,000 uh, patients. Um, the issue is what it does is it, it uses the um, your static venous pressure. It derives the static venous pressure using your regular uh, dynamic venous pressure. It's a it's an algorithm that we develop, and so we kind of uh, evolved. So that 0.55 threshold that we uh, you saw in mind is actually not a direct measurement of the interaxis pressure, but it's a derived pressure based upon various other uh, prior uh, preclinical uh, studies. Um, and in in that itself, about 30% drop is what we found. And and in your uh, cases you almost had a 60% drop in your pressure. That's really good. Um, I really feel the, on, the main reason why we are not using uh, any uh, pressure measurements in the intra-operative uh, stage is because of the cost. You know, you just saw, you showed that photo, additional IV pole, so many tubes, sterility that you have to keep in mind when we are doing the procedure. Um, it's okay in, in uh, occasional cases, like as you said, the targeted uh, lesions. Um, but yes, uh, hopefully there is a new device in the market. I don't know if it's available in the in in India. It has a pressure transducer at the end of vascular sheath. See that six French or seven French sheath that we all put it into the fistulas. There is a pressure transducer right at there, and uh, uh, the. The, what would be interesting is if someone can uh, do a study wherein you put that in, you measure it first in the at the point of where the needle is actually being cannulated for dialysis, you intervene, the pressure drops, let's see how much the pressure actually drops because at the end of the day, we, we are treating the dialysis and the fistula and all the other stenosis are just as an outcome that we are trying to see which is the culprit lesion and then doing it. Um, so in my mind, I think you're right on the track. We we definitely need to find another way of measuring these pressures without escalating the cost tremendously and it, increasing the procedural uh, uh, thing. And one additional thing I really loved in your presentation is how you decided to choose which stenosis to treat when there was more than one stenosis present in the same circuit, right? When you initially, when you treated the uh, uh, brachycephalic uh, lesion, but you did not touch the cephalic arch because there was no clinical indication to do that. Um, that is something that I would definitely advise all the um, uh, forum members and also the young uh, uh, physicians who are starting into the thing that you don't necessarily have to plasty every single lesion that you see during a study. 
by that itself, you can minimize the, your cost and exposure to various other complications. Uh, choosing the culprit lesion and treating the culprit lesion gives you the best clinical outcome. Uh, but I must commend you though, excellent work. Thank you, thank you, Lal. I think you made a great point when you said you should compress the jugular vein um, before really checking the pressures across the lesion because it might uh, take off you know, much of pressure. pressure. So then, uh, Venki, yes, uh, you, you, you said the headache was the major problem, was one yes. of the major problems for the patient. Yes, yes. Um, did it go off? I, uh, to be honest, I, I somehow felt I have convinced the patient that it has gone. <laughs> because uh, if uh, you are tackling only the uh, cephalic pain and not yes, the, uh, you know, proximal one, yes. the headache should persist. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But this reflex was there. Uh, but, but at least uh, he was not complaining, but I somehow, to be honest, I felt like I have distracted him from that to work for him. By doing this procedure. <laughs> <laughs> but his bleeding time has normalized. That much I can tell you. But I'm, I'm uh, Balasar, if I may uh, interrupt. Yeah. Um, this is one area, I think you, you brought in an excellent point. This is one area that we as a community have not really addressed our um, impact of central vein venous stenosis on the cerebral uh, vasculature, cerebral perfusion, and its uh, clinical manifestations. Um, about seven or eight years ago, there was a study which was being done in Toronto where they were doing MRI uh, diffusion images uh, in patients with relation to the central vein stenosis. I never saw the full manuscript or the results from that study ever. But the, the, the point I'm trying to make is if you have a blockage, if, if you have a brachiocephalic fistula with a flow greater than a liter, and you have a blockage in the break in the innominate vein, and that flow is now diverted through the left IJ going towards the brain. And now that has to come from the submandibular venous plexus to the right side and then drain down towards the heart. That itself creates a lot of venous hypertension in the cerebral vasculature. So the headache has to have been, uh, 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 should have a uh, be the reason or a manifestation from, uh, from the stenosis. The only, and I do believe that you have definitely improved the headache situation, Venki, to be honest with you, not just by diverting, but actually by treating that stenosis. Right. The one, one thought that I would like to put it in, uh, in this scenario is in such situations, another uh, way to handle the situation is by flow reduction. Okay, you could, you could have narrowed down the flow and decreased the flow into the fistula. That means all your other pressure profiles, everything changes, right? And then you may or may not need to do uh, the stenting and the whole nine yards. Because if you can match your inflow to your outflow, yes. then majority of the clinical symptoms will wane away. Yeah, and also uh, one more procedure has been uh, described in literature. Uh, turn down procedure. I don't know how many vascular surgeons or any surgeon is keen to do that. Whenever we are uh, dealing with this uh, cephalic heart stenosis, uh, we uh, we kind of recommend a turn down procedure wherein the uh, pro the proximal segment uh, to the stenosis at that point it is dissected and then it is connected to either the uh, axillary vein or the uh, basilic vein. So that way you don't have to uh, stent the lesion and uh, 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 for us, since the surgeons are relatively cheaper than the stent, so probably that is one option to be considered. Venki, was uh, uh, flow studies, I mean, flow measurement done in the fistula? Uh, I do not do it regularly, sir. It's oh. not done in this case. Okay. But but I can, it's a, it's a big fistula, so it should be at least 2.5 liters. Mm. I have yeah, two questions for Dr. Raj, sir, sir. Just uh, two more questions to you. Uh, so I, I came across some some studies telling like a, a pressure gradient of 10 millimeter mercury is considered though the number is arbitrary across a lesion if the difference is more than 10 millimeter you generally consider a lesion as significant is that what you follow as well and number two here if you if you see this case the gradient was 87 initially between the arch and the subclavian vein but uh, after the procedure, it has fell down. But even after that, it is 27. So that is still more than 10. But here we are comparing a central vein to a peripheral vein. 
So is it comparable in that way? So number one, uh, I don't do the interprocedure translational pressure measurements at, uh, at all um, because of the cost. Um, we uh, we get dinged for that, and so we I'm not using. That's why I use the vascular, which is a non-invasive uh, way of giving an idea of what has happened. So as far as the you're right, the ten millimeter gradient and other things they are totally arbitrary. It is uh, only from that one particular uh, group which has published majority of this work. Uh, there was another study. A very old one from Miami, uh, Dr. Arif Ratsif had uh, worked on, but it was not as impressive as uh, these people, uh, what they have um, published. So uh, the 10 is this particular groups. It has never been validated with hard endpoints. That means how that is Im uh, impacting the overall longevity in two years or three years or anything of that nature. So I think there is a if you're doing even like 10 or 20 patients of this Venki, I think you should publish this. Um, you just need about 20 patients to get a, a good publication out of this. So you should definitely pursue that. Um, your other question was uh, about the, the pressure in the peripheral versus central. Yes. Absolutely, you cannot compare. Because the, if you look at your images, there is a lesion in the subclavian vein also, right? So when you measured, and if you, it is very apparent in after you put the stent in, okay, and you kind of uh, took away that overlapping image from the central vein contrast and your other vein contrast, you can see like a small bead-like appearance of the subclavian vein. So that tells me that there is a underlying stenosis up there. Number two, the central vein gets feeding from a variety of other veins, depending upon the flow. And it also has tributaries where it gets dissipated, right? Well, um, so it's not totally a clean vein for you to do a, a post uh, stenotic measurement. So I, I wouldn't compare those two. In fact, next time when you do, if you have the lesion so high up in the arch, you may want to try to get the measurement very close to the arch and its confluence with the axillary vein. Because that would be a lot more uh, reflective of the pressure inside the cephalic arch. Okay. But excellent work. All right. Thank you, Vinky. Uh, although you were brought in later, I think uh, you made the day good. And uh, any comments from others? Thank you, Dr. Lal. I didn't notice you are in. And uh, I, was, yeah. I was really waiting for uh, Lal, sir. I sat through the whole session today. Oh. <laughs> Actually, Lal did reply to me telling, uh, you know, he may not be available, right? That's because, true. That's true for us. Yeah. 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 I think uh, we had a great session today, two, you know, diametrically uh, different uh, topics. And I think we'll uh, go like this in the uh, meetings to come. And uh, I thank the uh, faculty, the presenters, and the audience, and the guests, Lal and others. And we'll uh, finish the session today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. All. Good night. Thank, thank, you. Good night. thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Adil, yeah. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, well I thought uh, you you know. Oh, I'm, I'm back again, sir. No, no, I just had one at the end to catch you in the end, sir. Oh, good yeah. It was a good meeting, sir. And, uh, I think we should open that to Manjana, sir. Sir, I think he has got a vast experience, it seems. Girish. Hmm. See, work done in the peripheries are, you know, locked from others. So this is the way we'll have to expose all this. Okay. Right. Thank you. I think in our next meeting, uh, we can have one-to-one -one, I mean, a small group with Adil and, you know, uh, try to the, design the next module.
okay sir okay yeah, sir i have some suggestion they can give and like slowly sir because like i think manjana sir can uh, describe uh, basics about preparation and somebody has to do honest moses we uh -huh. can take a good video shoot and we can teach sir and uh, so one one thing we have to you know uh, just take out the fear among the the young people sir that's our should be our aim sir well actually i was going to ask the audience if the, i mean the junior friends who are there you know anything they want to ask i mean not exactly about the subject you know uh, about yes, sir, the people yeah. many young, young people are you know just sending a message to me sir that whether we are running any intervention program for them to learn so if they are very inquisitive they are very eager only thing they don't have platforms sir and um, in, neither we have any such I, at least i don't have any such kind of here a place to accommodate and teach them mm. so thank you well sir thank you well sir i'm yeah. still here sir yes yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. thank you yeah, thank you. yeah. yeah. Good night. The only thing, sir, this pre-operative assessment I want forgot to convey was that many people leave it to radiologists. They send a Doppler to the radiologist. So unless and until you do your own pre-operative yeah. Doppler. Hello, so sir, we have. Uh, I think this mapping thing. Uh, our boys are getting used to it, and uh, they start doing that. You know, much more than uh, doing the fistula itself, because correct, in correct, shops correct, uh, yeah. around the country, I see people picking up, and uh, even my juniors, I see very quickly. they are able to uh, do the ultrasound stuff only it is uh, doing fistulas and so that is what you know their hand movement and holding and i mean these subtle things we'll have to of course as uh, they will said you know they should be you know doing it and as you said also you know uh, sitting in the table there is no other way of learning but they are not willing to spend more time that is the thing uh, you know after a week or so they decide that uh, this is not a game for them and uh, they stop with other procedures so let us see but anyway not that everybody should be making first class i mean there are you know many areas so correct sir so let's see thank you thank you okay sir you asked about the pre operative like training materials and at that time forgot to ask i was not getting connected so i was initially told to use this placental umbilical artery and umbilical vein so lot of placentas will be available in the delivery rooms so you take the umbilical artery the size will be same as that of the radial artery so people mm -hmm. can make uh, uh, a arteriotomy and try to do anastomosis there but i tried once sir but i was not getting that feel it will be so patchulous that uh -huh. you won't get the feel of doing With the umbilical artery and vein, uh, so the only way is to be hands on the table. That's the only yes. way. Yeah. Yes. Right, sir. Okay, right. we'll take. Thank, thank you. Good night, sir. Good night, good night. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you all, sir.